All right, is the type of thing that we all suspect is true, but now there's data to prove it. Getting into an elite college is typically a tall task for anyone, but it's easier for the top 1%. That is according to an analysis from Harvard Economist Group Opportunity Insights. It showed that the country's elite schools are twice as likely to accept students from families of the top 1% than students from other income groups with similar test scores. We're joined by John Friedman. He's an economist, an economic professor at Brown University. He's also the author of of this analysis. I got that word right. Analysis is one of those words that's hard for me in English. Talk to me about what were the factors contributing uh, to more students from high income families being accepted into Ivy League schools? We found that there were three factors that really led to this admissions advantage, exactly as you say, where students from high income families are much more likely to be admitted than otherwise similar students from lower income families. First, we found that students who are legacy applications, those students who are children of alumni of a given institution, they have a substantial advantage. We also found that students who are recruited athletes uh, both have a substantial advantage and disproportionately come from high income families. Yeah. And then finally, we found that students with these uh, high ratings on non-academic factors like extracurriculars and personality characteristics, those students both came from the uh, high-income families and got a substantial admissions advantage. I mean, but how does it work? I mean, did they have access to, I don't know, tutoring? How? What gets them there? So I think being a legacy student and being a recruited athlete, that's just, uh, you know, something that, uh, that's kind of straightforward. The non-academic ratings, we think that's largely coming from the high schools that these students attend. So some students are attending, especially private non-religious schools, where there's a lot more effort devoted to college counseling and really advising the students through the whole college application process mm -hmm. in a way that produces maybe a better essay, the guidance counselor letters are better, uh, and that's you know even compared with uh, public schools in quite affluent neighborhoods, you see a huge difference in the uh, non-academic ratings of students coming from these private schools. I would imagine that students who need to work uh, also don't have the amount of time to dedicate to these extracurricular activities. Does that make sense? I think that's right. I think part of it is that students from high-income families may have more time to put into them, but also it's about knowing that these are factors that will be considered as part mm -hmm. of your admissions packet. Uh, I think it's not obvious for many students who come from backgrounds that are not as experienced with uh, applications and other friends, say, or their parents attending schools like this. So why are students from middle-income families, I guess, the least likely to get accepted into Ivy League schools? Right. We find even relative to low-income students, students from middle-income families have the lowest admissions rates and the lowest attendance rates. And part of it is that those students aren't as likely to have benefits from these three different factors, but also it's possible that schools are paying more direct attention, for instance, to the share of students they have on campus who are Pell eligible mm. from the bottom half of the income distribution, and they're paying less attention to the representation of middle-income students. So what will the end of affirmative action mean to these numbers? Well, the end of affirmative action is a huge change in the way that admissions offices treat uh, race of students who apply. And race in our context, um, all of the preferences for high income students are kind of working independently of race. But what this does, if one were to stop doing some of these things, it's not directly going to increase racial diversity, but it increases the number of slots in an incoming class that admissions offices have to fill with students that are coming from other types of diverse backgrounds, from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds, from certain underprivileged neighborhoods or something like that. Uh, I think that's going to be the way many of these schools respond to the fact that admissions uh, can't use race as a factor going forward. All right. John Friedman at Brown University, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.